Hi guys, uh, great talks this morning. Uh, uh, my name is Johannes Lundberg. Uh, I'll talk about the architecture of an API platform. Um, last time I had a talk, uh, the, I, the feedback I got was it's too technical, so uh, I hope this is the right crowd. Um, uh, squeeze in a bit in the front if you, if you have glasses like me. Uh, some slides will have a lot on them. Um, okay. So, uh, who am I? I'm a self-taught developer. I'm 46 Health co-founder and CEO. I strongly believe it's possible to combine powerful features with ease of use, uh, which is usually what APIs does. does. Uh, and I uh, also like food and travel. Um, <clears throat> now, let's get to the core. Uh, what is an API? or what I like to call the essence of an API. <laughs> it's turning traditional complexity into programmatic simplicity. Uh, this is really what all APIs are about. Uh, it's not just making them programmatic. It's not just making uh, this complexity simple to use. It's make, making it programmatic and simple at the same time. And. Uh, there are generally two kinds of APIs. Uh, and I'm not talking about business models or this kind of stuff. I'm talking about the actual API platform, the actual uh, thing you are delivering to your customers or your consumers. Uh, you have, uh, on one side, you have data access APIs, which is all about providing access to some kind of data. So the consumers of the API use your API to access the data. And it could be uh, in the field of open data, it could be Twitter and Facebook, you could have public transportation APIs and lots of partner APIs are also pr pr primarily about data access. Then you have the other kind of APIs, which have the side effects as the primary feature. You have cloud storage, where the purpose is for your data to be stored on a device somewhere, so even if the, if, even if the internet and the API breaks, your, your, your data is still there on those devices. Uh, you have online payment, when, where the purpose of your API uh, cons consumption is to actually facilitate payments. You have infrastructure as a service, uh, and you have cloud communications, where players like 46 Elks and Singe and Twilio is. Uh, and you can further break this down into uh, four, four categories. So each of these can either be self-contained, or they can be vendor-dependent. What I mean here is, either you have what, what is needed in-house uh, to actually provide all of your, the, the, provide your API, to, to allow your consumers to use your API, or you are strongly dependent on some kind of external party, either a vendor or another department if you're working in government. So you really can't control the whole, the whole thing that's happening behind your API. Uh, so uh, open, open data is a big, big topic when it comes to APIs. You, you have the open, easy open a data stuff where, where there's basically a CSV file imported into database, and then you know, an API on top of that. That's a very, th then you have everything self-contained. Let, let's jump right into the next slide, which is just about that. So data access self-contained. An an such an API could look like this. You have the consumer, uh, which is the API consumer. This is not about buying stuff. <laughs> you have an, an API, you have your API backend, and you have data which is basically inside your backend. And, and if you think about the architecture that's needed for an API like this, uh, if you have full control of your data, you can basically just you know, throw, throw in 10 replicas of the same, same backend with the same data. And if you control the updates of the data, then it's, it's very easy to make scalable and, and, and cloud ready. Uh, uh, then you have the vendor-dependent data access APIs, where you have vendor data here on one end, and it has to go back and forth. Uh, and you have to work with things like throughput, uh, because these things tend to be more legacy stuff. So uh, you're not allowed to do as many requests as you, uh, requests as you like to, those, to that vendor data. Uh, and you can't control when they do updates. So completely different architecture needed when you're working with this. Uh, 
so side effects, but, but self-contained. Uh, you have your machinery over here. It could be uh, it could be printing that you're printing stuff. You have your own machinery, so you can control your the whole the whole perspective there. So you you it's more complicated than a data access API, but you can still uh, you can still you know the, the, the challenges are. are easier to solve. They're not easy, but depending on exactly what you do, of course. Uh, if you look at vendor-dependent vendor uh, side effect APIs, uh, look similar to the vendor data, except the purpose here is not just passing data back and forth. It's about you know making an actual payment, making an actual phone call, sending an actual text message. Uh, and in reality, of course, it's more like this. Your API usually doesn't just have one main feature. You have more features, so you, and actually maybe like this. So there, there's, there's a lot of things you have to work with when you're building an architecture for an API platform. Uh, which boils down to the most important question when you're building an API. What's the main features of your API? Because your API has a purpose. Uh, your architecture is there to facilitate this purpose. So if you don't know what the main features of your API is, uh, if you can't put it into any of these four boxes, I showed earlier, uh, start with that. Uh, and sometimes it's not that easy. If you're, if you're a Lego or if you're a big enterprise and you, you're, you want to build an API, but, but you really don't know where to start, uh, uh, well, if you, if you like me, come from the startup world, there's really something which is called prototype first. So, because we all know development costs. We saw this slides earlier about the bridges breaking down. Uh, <laughs> So really, prototype first. Don't just start building you know, a big, robust, scalable thing that nobody will use, because you will probably not keep your job if, if, you, <laughs> if you build an API architecture like that. So prototype first, and what I mean is really, I mean really, this, this is what I mean. This is how your API should look like in the beginning. This is the API, API architecture initially. You should have your consumers, your API, and then what's beneath, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all in the beginning. There, there, there are two things that's important when you're doing APIs. The the main two two most important things are here. Your API should work, okay, according to specs. This is what's important. So initially, scale down throughput. Say you can you can send the ten messages per minute. Uh, say you can you can only do this many requests. But start here. Prove that your API actually fills the need for its consumers. So, so, so scale down, make it simple, prototype, and then comes all, this, all the things like maintainability, scalability, feature creep. Uh, which brings me to the next thing, the golden a rule of API design. When in doubt, leave it out. Even when you're prototyping, you know, uh, <laughs> If, if you don't think there is a need for this feature in the API, leave it out. Your, your consumers, API consumers, will get back to you and say, hey, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? That's when you, when you add this to your prototype. And you start by making it a beta feature, and then you roll it up publicly. Because when something is in your API, there's no going back. You know? people, when people have built their implementations towards your API, they don't want to change their code. You know, and their code could be running for 10, 15, 20 years. So, and it's a, it's a really bad customer experience by you know, suddenly cutting the services for your customers. We've seen some examples of that throughout the industry. But, so keep this in mind when you're designing an API. And <clears throat> OK, so you, you, you started you doing some prototyping. You, you've come up with, like, this is the features I want to have in, in my API. Then comes a lot of technical questions like, OK, XML versus JSON. Uh, you have servers versus infrastructure as a service. Should you host your own stuff? Uh, should it be push or pull? Uh, is it OAuth or basic OAuth? Uh, it, is consistency more important than reliability? Um, to give you just a few words about the last thing here. Consistency. When you're doing phone number allocation, for instance, you don't want two customers to get the same phone numbers. So you want to have consistency. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, if, if you're building like a Twitter API, it's more important that API consumers get data 
uh, than uh, getting the latest data. There, there's a saying here that you, know, you can always fix data later, but you can't buy, to, uh, you can buy back two hours of downtime. So, uh, so my advice here is really to think about the features you're building, uh, think about which ones require consistency, which ones require reliability, and don't just have a one solution works for everything. Uh, and uh, eventually, you will end up with something like this. Uh, you will have your consumers. You will have your API. You will have your failover mechanism, which means you will have your backup data center. Uh, you will have your load balancer. You will have your web servers. You will have your message bus. You will have your workers. You will have your databases. You will have your background processes like billing. Uh, and you will still have the vendor services and the machinery. So this is, this is, some, this is uh, probably what you will end up with after a while when you, when you, when you have your prototype. Uh, and and this, this, this is actually with the same API as with a simple prototype dummy implementation. So the API doesn't have to change at all, even though you're making something which is much more maintainable, scalable, and uh, something that grows uh, together with your API consumers. Um, so I want to share some, some of the learnings I've had, uh, which is do versioning. So if you're thinking about versioning, do it. Uh, uh, use JSON. You heard from Kim Lane before that that's a good way to do it. There's really no, re no reason to use XML with, on your API outwards. There are very, very few cases where you, where you, where you should do that. Very, very few. Um, and probably one of the most important learnings, talk to API consumers. Prototype, add the basic features, then add stuff later on. Uh, work with your consumers and really uh, don't tailor your API towards one specific consumer, but read really like what, what is uh, what your API consumers are gradually needing in order to keep your API consistent. And select vendors carefully. When you're having vendor data or vendor, the vendor services that your API depends on, uh, really be careful when you're selecting those. Because, uh, <clears throat> and there's a perspective here that's often forgotten. Uh, some people think of vendors like commercial entities, like corporates, companies. Uh, providing services. But vendor, vendors can actually be an open source product. So if you're, if you're building your API architecture on top of a couple open source products, the maintainer of those open source products are vendors in this, in this sense. So if you're having a crappy maintainer of an open source product, then, uh, you, you can really, you can, it can really force you to throw out a big part of your architecture uh, because the project is going in a way which is not compatible with what you're doing. Uh, I'm sure some people have Android phones here. If you're curious about why it took so long for Bluetooth to arrive on Android, that's the answer. Uh, the, the Bluetooth maintainers there were not really uh, good ones. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, and, and then there's an even more important lesson here. Uh, or, well, sorry, not more important, but, but uh, building APIs should be complex. What I mean with this is you're creating an API because you have some complexity. You want to make it simple. And the actual value you are providing to your API consumers is removing that complexity from your API consumers. So if it's not complex to build your API, it's not complex for a competitor to do the same thing, most probably. It's not, and, and, uh, and you're not really, it's, it's hard to charge for something when, uh, when you're not providing that much of a value. So, so if you're struggling with you know, building a good architecture for your API, uh, think of it as, you know, it's a lesson you have to learn 
And even if it takes you know, a year for you to get, or two to make a good architecture, it's, it's probably worth it because you're giving this value to your customers, your API consumers. And I want to end, end with a little bit about, uh, actually, some, some very internal slides from 46 Elks. So uh, this is recorded, but I've cut out the, the confidential stuff. Uh, for those who don't know what 46 Elks is, we're a voice, SMS, and MMS in one easy API, or cloud communications platform. We are focused on Europe, Scan Sweden and Scandinavia initially. Uh, we launched three and a half years ago. We have a JSON API, uh, a very good one uh, in my wording. Uh, and the overhead schematics like of what we do is, looks like this. We have custom applications, we have simple APIs, we have our platform, API platform here. We have, and on the other end, we have customers, employees, event audience machines, which we communicate with through mobile networks. And if you lift the hood, this is how, this is the schematics of how it looks like. You see, I've put out some dummy wording for some of the stuff, which is confidential. But uh, after a while, this is probably what you end up with. Uh, it's a lot of stuff to to uh, to work with and keep keep running and maintain and make scalable. And in our case, when we have you know lots and lots of carriers we're working with, we have to make redundant couplings to all of these carriers for each of our data centers. <clears throat> so, uh, but it's worth it. It's, it's, this is uh, the complexity you're removing from your customers. And just a couple of technical things. NGINX for SSL, SSL offloading is really good. We're using Python and G-Event for our API backends. That's a very nice technology to use as well. Uh, So once again, this is, this is what you deliver to your customers. This is what it looks like, or can look like in the back end. Uh, and that's actually it for me. Uh, I, if they, there's going to be questions later, so I'll leave the time for the next speaker, and I can take your questions afterwards. Great. Great, Johannes. That was uh, really, uh, really great talk. Before.